NATO has to be able to operate uh, on the sea, over the sea, and also under the sea. If you are an old historian, you'd say maritime power is huge warships giving influence, you know, gunboat diplomacy and all the rest of that. I see it now as very different. We have a real enemy and a real aggressor. All nations' navies are, are the epitome of a nation's capability and resolve for conflict prevention. And the NATO Rapid Reaction Force, I think, describes that conflict prevention. From mine clearance to defence from ballistic missiles, from humanitarian response to counter piracy, NATO's maritime power provides some of the most mobile and flexible response to crises. Secure seas mean the safe transit of 85% of world goods, from essential fuel to the latest iPhone. Protecting trade, infrastructure and populations requires more than just might. It needs networked information and, most of all, multinational cooperation. NATO's maritime strategy is changing. New maritime operation Sea Guardian will be a much more flexible way to respond to crises quickly and adapt to meet any new threat. But to understand how it might work in the future, we must first look to the past. Operation Sea Guardian builds on two of NATO's largest and most successful maritime operations, anti-piracy operation Ocean Shield in the Horn of Africa and anti-terrorism operation Active Endeavour in the Mediterranean. They've both demonstrated years of capable networked intelligence sharing that has almost eradicated the danger to merchant shipping in these areas. Merchant vessel Pollux, merchant vessel Pollux, this is NATO warship Foxtrot 220 calling you channel 16, over. In the Mediterranean Sea, multinational ships have been conducting the maritime equivalent of checkpoints since 2001, challenging shipping to prove they are who they say they are, helping to prevent illegal shipping and trafficking, which could fund criminal networks, including terrorism. We're part of a task group of five or six different ships, and we've all been given an area to search and patrol uh, for terrorist activity and uh, any other suspicious like goings on in the area. So we'll close the contact to within five nautical miles and once uh, we have it visually we can determine how it compares to its AIS data. So if it says it's 150 metres and it's quite clearly 300, we know that there's a discrepancy there. Reporting back to NATO's Maritime Command, the Maritime Operations Centre crunch up to 8,000 signals from ships a day to build up an overview of shipping. Working closely with the NATO Shipping Center, NATO's global picture is a powerful tool that was called upon in early 2016 when Germany, Greece and Turkey reached out to NATO for help in the migration crisis. The whole region of Mediterranean has changed last year with all the Arab Spring movements, the instability coming from the Middle East. Uh, that adds up to several factors contributing to the uh, increased risk in the situation in the secu security environment within the Met. NATO can help uh, in a lot of ways. Firstly, in terms of resources, in terms of bringing ships to uh, the Aegean, and just and also just having a presence there uh, is in itself a disincentive for smugglers. Supporting the European Union border agency Frontex and Greek and Turkish authorities. NATO helps to build up a picture of what's happening in the Aegean, conducting reconnaissance, monitoring and surveillance of illegal crossings. There has to be real-time information exchange between the, the two operations because you have a Frontex operation, Poseidon, which is already uh, in place operating in, uh, in Greek waters. And the big advantage about the NATO operation is that it can operate in Turkish waters, which is something the, that Frontex can't do. When I see some people who, uh, who is very desperate and who, who is in pain, uh, it pains me very much and, uh, and also I am very proud of as a commander of the ship uh, to support the people and uh, to reduce the uh, number of loss of life uh, at sea. The mission in the Aegean tapped into a long history of NATO maritime expertise of building up what's known as a recognised maritime picture. With so much raw information available, today's networked maritime intelligence represents a quantum leap in surveillance capacity over just a few years ago meaning that we can compare in real time transmitted data to database information in order to validate names of ships, their registry numbers, cargo and recent and upcoming ports of call. If you think in the Mediterranean there are 900 organisations that are building a maritime picture, all of them for one reason or another keeping it to themselves rather than sharing it. Now if I can get them to share 5% of their information and intelligence and each one of them does it, and I turn it round and make sense of it using my team here properly and then sell it back to NATO. 
NATO will have a, a massively different picture than they've ever had before. I suddenly start to get a bit of a 360 view that is helpful for everybody. NATO's core maritime strength is divided into four multinational standing maritime groups that are ready to respond to any tasking. With years of focus on land-based campaigns, these groups are finding a new lease of life as attention turns back to the seas. NATO, quite frankly, has been focused on Afghanistan, rightly so, for the last decade or so, and we've now got to restore a broader contingent capability within NATO. If the world's attention was focused on operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, what brought it back to the seas? One reason is the annexation of Crimea by Russia that saw an increase of aggressive Russian surface and submarine activity in the Black and Baltic seas. Another is the ongoing instability in the Middle East and North Africa, which has seen an increase in illegal activity in the Mediterranean. Eight years ago, we allowed the maritime, you know, along with many other parts of NATO, to stultify a little bit, to get a little bit lost in what we were doing. And of course, there was not a threat perceived. And that has changed, sadly, with the world situation. But what, what we are starting to see is that there needs to be components of the maritime, like land and air, who really can react quite quickly, need to break free of NATO process and procedures to change the way they're doing business. The speed with which NATO maritime forces were deployed to the Aegean is an indicator of how fast future crises could be met and how mobile maritime forces can be. What people don't realise is for the first time ever, I actually moved two task groups. I didn't ask permission. Um, I, I just moved them so that we were ready to respond if political decision makers needed to go an extra step. It's that readiness to respond through forward deployment of forces that will provide the core of NATO's future maritime strategy. Instead of single mission operations, a flexible force ready for a range of war and peacetime activities. We don't have to look far to find an example. The NATO Response Force is a multifaceted military force constantly at high readiness. Part of the response force is a maritime component. Warships can travel upwards 360 uh, miles uh, in, in a day, uh, perhaps more than that. But when we're there, we're almost immediately ready if we understand the environment. We're at high readiness, but we draw upon allied nations ships uh, to respond to a, uh, to a time of crisis, whether it was an Article 5 or, or other one. So that's what the, Na the uh, NATO uh, response force is. In the maritime, it involves ships, it involves aircraft, it involves submarines, it involves amphibious capabilities, and it works alongside the land and air components. HMS Ocean, a landing platform capable of launching aircraft and troops to support any mission, is the flagship of the NATO response force for 2016. I mean, first and foremost, it's a huge privilege to, for Ocean, the Royal Navy, to be the flagship for NATO for 2016. It was a vast amount of training last year, uh, and we're at high readiness throughout the year for that. Um, and it means we've got to be ready for whatever may happen. And, and as you know, the world's an uncertain place uh, at the moment, uh, and we need to be ready to move wherever NATO may want us to go and to take charge of what happens. Uh, and that could be anything from from a high-end warfighting environment down to disaster relief, uh, humanitarian operations. And part of my job as the commanding officer is to make sure the ship's company are ready to do that. And by that I mean the ability to put uh, armed forces across the beach uh, by a combination of either surface craft or aviation. And we can tailor that exactly on, on the operation. Amphibious landings, as they're known, are a key part of warfare or humanitarian operations, accessing people in remote and hard-to-reach places. It's something NATO nations and partners train regularly. An amphibious operation can be done in two different ways, uh, one via surface or the other via air. If you have one, more than one ship, even within the United States Navy, the communications just between those two ships can be challenging. Now add a different service and then add a third ship. Now add uh, 14 or 15 different countries and uh, now we're, we're combined. That is itself a extremely complex, uh, challenging, but the training we gain by doing this uh, is extremely valuable. Without nation support, there is no NATO. Nations have the ships and personnel that go to make up NATO maritime forces, which helps support their own national interest. One area of interest for the United Kingdom has been the Baltic region. What does NATO offer us? It offers us some really effective high-end warfighting training. It offers us the opportunity to work alongside our NATO allies, who will be the people that we work with in times of tension and war, understand how they work so that we can work more effectively and efficiently uh, together. And it also offers us an opportunity to understand the environment where we're most likely to operate in times of war. 2016 saw an enhanced UK maritime presence in the Baltic. 
including one frigate to standing NATO Maritime Group 1. It is unfortunate that over the last, last few years we have seen uh, an emerging rather than a receding threat uh, from a very capable uh, um, armed force within Russia. So one of the areas where it is critical that we as a Royal Navy, as part of NATO alongside our allies, uh, train together is to be able to respond, to provide reassurance to those nations that are closest to Russia. With rough waters and unforgiving temperatures, the Baltic Sea is a radically different environment to the balmy waters of the Mediterranean. But it sees almost 10% of the whole world's maritime trade, as well as the site of key infrastructure like undersea electric cables, gas pipelines and fibre optic cables. Our prosperity and security is dependent upon global trade and the access uh, to the oceans uh, and those maritime agreements that allow access to that notion, those oceans. Since the annexation of Crimea, energy security has become a priority for countries who traditionally rely on Russia for their energy needs. In 2014, the first floating terminal liquefied natural gas, or LNG barge, with the symbolic name of independence, was commissioned in Lithuania. It has the capacity to supply 4 billion cubic metres of gas annually, supplying not only Lithuanian needs, but also about 80% of the total demand of the Baltic states taking away the need to rely on Russia. Baltic neighbour Poland has also invested in the LNG option, and in Finland, active expansion of LNG is also expected over the next few years, using seaports to handle large gas tankers. It's not only about economics. For us, first of all, energy security is about politics. It's about enhancement of our transformation from one political system to another that nobody could manipulate or abuse dependency um, and you know to try to um, and try to kind of ruin our political system because this is not about energy first of all this is about political stability about democracy and the stronger we are economically the stronger we are politically with energy security at the forefront of many nations minds keeping the baltic safe open and free is a priority Baltic seaports also see thousands of NATO troops and equipment deployed for exercises, committed to enhancing Baltic defence and deterring potential aggression. Annual exercise Baltop provides an opportunity for NATO forces to practice amphibious landings, mine clearance and anti-submarine warfare. But it also welcomes non-NATO countries like Sweden and new participant Finland to improve methods of working together in a crisis. Baltops is a major exercise in a part of the world that we're really concerned about. The exercise is demanding, but the exercise will come out having trained up a range of different neighbours in a way that they haven't enjoyed for some time. It's work with partners across the seas that helps NATO project stability beyond its borders and takes us back south, almost back to the Mediterranean. The Black Sea is home to NATO nations Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey, and also NATO partners Ukraine and Georgia. It also hosts Russia's Black Sea Fleet, which has grown significantly since the annexation of Crimea. In order to see how important it is, just look at the map. You can see the Black Sea is bordered by allies, by partners, and the Black Sea is connected to the Mediterranean, which is connected to the wider ocean and waterways. So that's the reason Black Sea remains crucial for NATO, and we want to make sure to be here in the Black Sea whenever it's possible with our standing naval groups. Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria, Georgia and Ukraine all have a very good picture of what's happening in the Black Sea. Is the Black Sea a war zone? No, of course it's not. But it worries us because we don't understand Russian behaviour amongst everything else. Georgia, a NATO partner, has no dedicated navy and relies on a small coast guard to protect its coastlines. 20% of its territory has been occupied by Russia since 2008. Georgia is a, a littoral country, we have sea, and that it means that we have threat from sea also. That after occupation of Crimea, this military and military political balance in uh, Black Sea absolutely changed. Uh, Black Sea countries need additional and other kind of uh, security measures and security formats. And I think that in that, uh, uh, in that case, Georgia can play quite significant role for uh, this security uh, format. Part of NATO's assistance package to Georgia is helping to improve their naval defence. Standing maritime groups, including ships from Black Sea neighbours, have started making increased port visits in the area and helping the Georgian Coast Guards improve their patrols. Of course, Russia springs to our own attention because it's a very close neighbour of NATO. It's not the only one. There are many others, above all, uh, ranging eastward, if you want. They're all uh, 
uh, investing heavily into more than and capable maritime, uh, maritime assets. One of these threats is the proliferation of ballistic missiles by countries in the southeast. Ships form an essential part of NATO's ballistic missile defence. Here at a demonstration off the coast of Scotland, US Aegis ships intercept a missile tracked by powerful radar mounted on a Dutch ship. The Aegis ships, stationed at Rota, Spain, are capable of being deployed anywhere in the world to counter the threat of missiles being launched from an increasingly unstable Middle East. But NATO is not just a military alliance. It invests in maritime scientific research. At the Centre for Maritime Research and Experimentation in La Spezia, Italy, scientists are testing underwater drones that can map the seabed, helping ships to move freely. They're also developing a network between drones, like a kind of underwater internet, that will allow ships to draw live feeds from the bottom of the sea. Unmanned vehicles, robotics, sensor networks can be applied to deliver new capabilities that were impossible before, or to do traditional missions in ways that are less expensive or less risky. And that's where CMRE plays a role in our engagement with the research community, in creating platforms which are interoperable, can do different missions, and can uh, communicate even underwater. Maritime commanders are going to have to get smarter and more efficient when it comes to using what they have. Lines are increasingly blurred between military operations outside our borders and national law enforcement operations within. The future for NATO Maritime lies in working together with other organizations, sharing information and being able to deploy rapidly to assist in any crisis. Go on, next myself. Let's get it. Maritime capabilities, uh, uh, if you if you just uh, uh, compare with land, uh, sometimes even air, their own characteristic is every investment is a very long-term investment. So you cannot just make it happen in months when the necessity arises. You have to be ready years in advance with the planning, with the right capabilities at sea, and you have to have the right mix of them. Theatre anti-submarine warfare and anti-submarine warfare in the round is one I think we need to polish back, and we're doing that very aggressively. There are new weapon systems and new tactics and procedures that other people are using, whether you're Russia or Daesh, which we need to get on top of and get ahead of. So where might NATO be headed in the future? I think the Aegean uh, activity was a real illustration of where we may be going. There was great concern over the movement of people and going through Turkey into Greece. That was raw, hard politics uh, and nothing to do with me. But once they made the decision, we moved a task group in 18 hours and had a task group uh, on the ground doing its business within 24 hours. Whatever the threat or crisis, NATO needs to be ready, but the main challenge is knowing what that threat might be. While NATO navies must maintain their traditional naval mission capabilities, intelligence gathering and sharing, and high readiness and flexibility are skills far more adaptable to future threats than would be a torpedo or an anti-ship cruise missile. In the meantime, NATO's maritime community will continue to perfect the tactics to make the maritime environment as unwelcoming as possible to those who would disrupt safe and free seas. I think the threat is coming closer and closer to our backyard. When people can see film footage of Russian submarines fitted with very powerful missile systems heading down the North Sea um, and, and heading into the Mediterranean and into the Black Sea, that worries them and it needs to worry them. You can detect how people are happy that when these kind of ships and this kind of um, NATO uh, visitors coming. It means that uh, we continue uh, moving uh, right direction and our interoperability with NATO is it's become more and more deeper and wider. What NATO has to be is relevant. We have to determine our role in that, noting that we don't own the, the solutions entirely militarily, but we can certainly contribute to them.